Welcome to the fourth webinar for the Charles Darwin Evolution in Tropical Australia MOOC. My name is Keith Christian. I'm here at Charles Darwin University in Darwin, in the Northern Territory of Australia. And I'm joined with, by uh, Dr. Steve Reynolds, who is also in Northern Australia, but farther west in, uh, in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. And uh, hopefully we have all the technical issues worked out that we'll be able to talk to each other seamlessly. So welcome, Steve. Uh, thanks, Keith, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome again to the to web webinar. Um, and this week we are in part four, uh, so we're going to talk a bit about uh, Northern Australia, monsoonal Northern Australia. Um, so this week uh, again, so we will just as a general introduction to the webinar. Uh, so we really want to just go over some other points of interest about monsoonal northern Australia, so we've covered a fair bit of that uh, in the MOOC itself. And uh, we'll, we'll just talk a bit about, so we're in the dry season in, in northern Australia, so at this particular time of year. Uh, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about the discussion forums, but we also have some opportunities for, um, for people to respond, so if you want to um, uh, chat at any time or you have questions and so on, and also we'll have just a few little questions, so you can you can um, do uh, polling and we'll see how people's, uh, what people's responses are to those questions. So, what have we done uh, this week? So in part four, so again, as we've mentioned, we started with Darwin, we talked about evolution, uh, then we came to Wallace and the Malay Archipelago, so Southeast Asia, so just north of here. And now we're bringing it back to Northern Australia, uh, to the top end, and um, so we really, uh, hopefully people have had a chance to look at the series of videos. Uh, there's various researchers from CU talking about different sorts of animals and so on and their adaptations to the environment in Northern Australia. Um, so that, that's really interesting because a whole range of different animals there that they're talking about. Uh, the other thing that we looked at this week is some seasonal calendars. So uh, there are a lot of uh, seasonal indicators and animals, plants, weather conditions that tell people uh, what things are going on and when certain animals are breeding and when it's a good time to hunt for certain things. Um, and these ideas have been, people have been, you know, living in this country for thousands of years. So they've, they've come to understand the, the country very well and the environment very well. Uh, and the last thing, we've got a little bit there about the School of Environment itself. And I believe, uh, Keith, there's a, there's a video about that as well. Yeah, there's a, a short video just, just talking about the different programs that we offer, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, for, for studies. Right. So, yeah, so have a, have a little look at that, uh, that video as well. So, like I said, um, we're bringing it here to, to Northern Australia. So here's a very broad, general view of Northern Australia. Um, we have... Um, so Darwin is around about here. Unfortunately, this image is a little bit under cloud. Uh, you can see Melville Island. You can see the Coburg Peninsula. Um, this is the border here with Western Australia. And so there's, you can actually see Lake Argyle, which is quite large. Um, several Sydney harbours. Uh, and this is in the Kimberley Division of Western Australia. And then over in the east, the Gulf. So this is the Gulf of Carpentaria. And again, here's the border. Uh, you can see with, with Queensland there. So it's quite a large area and a lot of this area here is uh, what we call Arnhem Land. Um, lots of escarpment country and things like that. And then there's also a little group island way, way over here. So quite an extensive coastline and uh, a really quite a large, large area, uh, the top end. Um, we, so we've spoken in previous weeks um, about Charles Darwin and of course uh, he did travel around the world and so this is the view of uh, the Beagle's voyage around the world from the Journal of Research Researchers. So Darwin wrote the journal after he, after he returned from the voyage um, and you know as we all know he, he visited South America, uh, he spent a lot of time in Brazil, he visited the Galapagos which are there uh, and then on the way back they went right across the Pacific Ocean uh, and came to New Zealand, so the very top part of New Zealand. He did visit Sydney, uh, Tasmania, and what's called Albany um, now, but um, 
back then it, it had a different name, but he didn't actually visit Darwin. So Darwin up here in Northern Australia uh, didn't quite make it to um, to Northern Australia at all, so it's only really Southern Australia. But as we've mentioned, the third voyage, the next voyage of the Beagle did uh, go to Northern Australia and mapped a lot of the coastline in Northern Australia, visited the Kimberley and also came to Darwin Harbour and that's how they came to name the, the place uh, Port Darwin and how the, the city itself now is named after Charles Darwin. Uh, similarly, um, Wallace, travelling a little bit later, um, and this is the eastern part of the Malay Archipelago, so his uh, Sulawesi, he calls it Salibs there, uh, you can see several of the islands, there's Flores. So he did go to Timor, which is very close. Uh, he visited Kupang and, um, and, and Dili, and that's only an hour flight north of Darwin, so very close. Uh, he went to Arrow Island, which we mentioned. He made that big journey out there where he saw um, birds of paradise. Uh, but he didn't come to Darwin. And in fact, at the time, there really weren't any settlements in Darwin. There were a few short-term settlements, Port Essington and so forth, um, but there was no real place for him to visit in any, in any event, so he never never did make it to Australia. So, okay. So, um, hopefully all you, everybody's familiar with this. Uh, this is the chat, if you want to put some um, questions. We've got a question here. What were the red bits on the map, Steve? Uh, so we'll get a little bit onto that, but that's actually a, a fire spot. So that's um, one way there's a little fire marked on the map. Yeah, and we'll talk about that actually in, in a minute. Um, so we wanted to just talk generally about, so we talked a bit about the environment, a bit about the climate, a bit about things like fire, um, but if we want to look at the different types of environments on, on a finer scale, um, there are different uh, habitat types, so uh, particular types of uh, vegetation, so vegetation communities, and often there will be particular groups of animals that occupy these habitat types. And so in Northern Australia, um, we can broadly um, classify the habitat types into these types you can see here. So ranging from sort of upland areas on the escarpment country uh, through savannah and then down to wetter areas floodplains and lagoons and then coastal areas as well, so mangroves and actually the, and then the open ocean as well. I might just, um, might just jump so in there, Steve, and, and say that the, uh, yeah. in terms of area covered, the eucalypt, uh, the, the savannah woodland is by far, in a way, the most predominant. And some of these other uh, habitats are really almost islands surrounded by uh, savannah, and so we, uh, they're, they're really uh, sort of form some special habitats because they're um, sort of minority habitats, I guess. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's so that's right, so there's quite a lot of the, the uh, woodland, sort of lowland um, eucalypt savannah. So this is just an example of that, that sort of savannah. So fairly typical, this is in the dry season, so you have an overstory, there's some eucalypts, this is uh, Eucalyptus miniata or Darwin woolly butt. You have some middle layer species. So you'll have um, small trees and, and large shrubs, if you like. And so here are some saplings, some sapling eucalypts, and then a grass layer. And so consistently with savannah, you have a, a grass layer, it's an important part of the savannah. And as you can see here, this is sort of early dry season, so it's already drying out, it's looking a bit brown. Um, the grass is, is really starting to dry out. So that's sort of typical kind of structure. There's several layers. Um, but not multiple layers like you might see, for example, in a, um, in a rainforest. Uh, and it's fairly open. It's basically an open woodland is, is how you would characterise it. So that's savannah, and as Keith mentioned, that's, that's very widespread. That's, that's um, across northern Australia. And so another type of habitat is uh, monsoon forest. And so uh, in this situation, for example, you have um, permanent water. So this is a place called Robin Falls, which is south of Darwin. And so you get uh, taller trees, more dense vegetation, uh, dense tree layer, and, and more of a canopy. So over the top, you get a more dense canopy. And the sorts of things you might see, so for example, in this, in this photo here, uh, these are actually fruit bats. 
So you can see there's a whole colony of fruit bats. It's a little bit hard to see, but these black dots are a colony of fruit bats hanging up in the trees. So during the day, they'll roost in the trees, make a bit of noise, um, but they're up far enough away that they're away from predators and things like that. So they're very secure up there. And then these are the sort of, sorts of places where um, they all stay during the day. I might just add, Steve, that uh, in, at least in the Northern Territory, most of our, a, a lot of our monsoon forest patches are really just that, patches, pretty small around streams. There are some that are quite a bit bigger in, in wetland areas around, um, around rivers and other uh, larger bodies of water, but no, no vast uh, rainforests like, uh, you know, like, like there were in North Queensland or still are in North Queensland uh, and, and in New Guinea and places in Indonesia to the north. But still, they're very important habitats, very interesting. And, uh, you know, just the, the, the contrast between the surrounding sea of savanna and these islands of monsoon forest is, is uh, very striking. And uh, differences between the flora and the fauna in those habitat types. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, so, and that's partly, I think, because, you know, as we mentioned, we're in the dry season, because you have this long period of dry weather, uh, you know, in the tropics where you get these big rainforests, you're basically getting rainfall all year. Uh, in the dry season here, it dries out. So it's only in those places where there's enough moisture in the soil to support these types of plant communities that you get, um, you get monsoon forests. And these are just some examples of the sorts of plants you might see so this is a, a strychnine plant. Actually, the leaves are actually a little bit poisonous, as the name suggests. Uh, things like the fountain bush here, uh, Opelia. Um, and this is kind of a scram luck. So it, it grows and it sort of goes under other trees and then and climbs up other trees. There are several species of figs, and uh, figs are really a tropical group. So in New Guinea, there are lots and lots of species. In Northern Australia, we have, we have a fair few. This is a banyan fig, which is actually um, occurs also in, in Asia and things like the, the peanut tree here. And a lot of these um, plants uh, in the in the coastal vine thicket, so you have the sort of wet permanent water uh, monsoon forest, and then you have a vine thicket, which is a form of, of rainforest patch. And those areas, because they're drier, they dry out in the dry season, they don't have the permanent water, a lot of these plants actually will lose their leaves. So things like uh, the circulia here, this, this uh, strychnos, they will actually lose their leaves in the dry season and then, and then grow them again uh, once, once it starts to get wet. Um, so a lot of those plants are elements we spoke about of some of those Asian elements, the Malaysian flora that have come down through Southeast Asia and now occur in rainforest patches in Northern Australia as well. And as another <laughs> example, uh, here you can see um, uh, palms, so these are um, Carpenteria palms and typical of monsoon forest patches, very thick, dense vegetation and a very dense canopy, so 80 or 90 percent cover uh, and very tall. So some of these trees uh, might be, you know, 25, 30 metres tall, some of these bigger trees. So quite tall. So yeah, and as Keith mentioned, so quite different and distinct from the, uh, the savannah which surrounds it. Uh, so another environment that we've mentioned, so here's an example of the escarpment country and this is in Kakadu and this is uh, near Langey Rock and some of the escarpment country is really spectacular as you can see uh, in this image. Uh, if you ever get a chance to Kakadu, go to Kakadu, you should, should do so. Um, and again, there are particular types of animals uh, in this environment. And actually there are monsoon patches also in these places where there's, um, where there's creeks and wet areas and so on, because they can be quite uh, sheltered. Yeah, so again, some of these escarpment patches are, are almost like islands surrounded by savannah. So there, there are really big, massive uh, expanses of escarpment country in, in Kakadu and, and farther east in Arnhem Land. But in other parts of the Northern Territory, in, in the top end, there are sort of islands, smaller patches of, out, of outcrops of escarpment. And again, you find specific animals in those habitats and they're almost, uh, it's almost like, um, uh, like I said, a, a sea of savannah with these islands of, of escarpment dotted through it. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting how that um, 
So certain animals will just be in those places and then there will be other rocky areas elsewhere and they will only occur things like rock wallabies and some of the animals we've spoken about. And there are just a couple of endemic uh, species as well, so a couple of birds, some reptiles, and also quite a few plants up on the very top of the outer escarpment country that are endemic to those uh, those regions. So they're, they're, they're kind of special animals in that sense. They only occur in those places. This is another example. So you can see the rocky country. Um, this is in Litchfield National Park, just south of Darwin. Uh, this is Florence Falls. So again, some permanent water and some very rocky habitats with sort of distinctive uh, distinctive types of plants or vegetation communities um, and as we mentioned some types of animals so for example this is uh, some geckos this is a, a gohira this is a species of, of oedura so these as you can see they're on rocks they only really occur on rocks these species they're in that escarpment country or hill country and other places um, you don't you don't find them so where there's particularly where there's caves and overhangs and lots of rocks and boulders for them to shelter under. And uh, in this photo here, he's a little bit hidden away, but I don't know if you can see, but there is a rock wallaby just poking his head out from behind that rock. Uh, and wherever you get that really rocky country, and we spoke about rock wallabies uh, last week actually, um, you'll get those sorts of animals. And again, they're restricted really to that rocky country. So there are really a whole range of animals that, that just occur in those habitats. Yes. Um, the last habitat I just thought I'd, I'd mention, so we haven't quite covered all of them, but uh, is the mangroves. And um, we can see just some examples here. This is the uh, stilt root mangrove. And so, for example, it has all these, um, these roots that, that actually come out of the stems and go down into the mud. And what that does is it just helps to support the plant. So as the tide goes in and out and all that mud's moving around, it just helps to hold them there. And that's actually very difficult to uh, climb through, as you can imagine. It's quite a difficult country to get through. And this is another example. This is the grey mangrove Abyssinia. And here you can see the, the pneumatophores or the breathing roots poking up out of the mud. So they're the actual roots of the plant poking up. And again, typical inhabitants, lots of marine invertebrates. So a lot of these fiddler crabs are very common in the mud, making little burrows down in the mud. And also a lot of these other um, sassamid crabs. So these. And a lot of these are actually vegetarians. They eat the leaves of the, of the mangrove species and lots of snails and other sorts of uh, invertebrates in the mangroves. Yeah, I guess it's worth noting here about the mangrove forests of northern uh, Australia is that they're very diverse. I mean, there are, other, there are man, a lot of man, places, mangroves are in a lot of different places in the world. And of course, they're more diverse in the tropics and uh, it's no different here. Uh, we've got something on the order of 30 different species of mangroves in the Northern Territory, um, and that's, that, that's quite a few uh, to have in one, one area. Yeah, yeah, so I've only shown just a couple of examples of the, of the mangroves uh, species that we have. You know, this is, and these are just in Darwin Harbour, around, around the Darwin region. So there are some of the main uh, environments and some examples of the animals and plants and so on that, that live in them. Uh, so now we thought we'd just go and have a little quick um, uh, uh, poll. So uh, you've got your little um, polling menu there, response menu over on the left. Uh, so just click on that and make your uh, make your choice. So the first question we had. Now, hopefully, if you've been watching the videos, you will know this. Hopefully, it shouldn't be too hard. But um, it's an unusual thing where one of these reptiles lays its eggs actually under the water. So uh, the frill neck lizard, well, hopefully you're familiar with that. That's a, it's actually a type of um, dragon lizard or a gamut. Uh, very unusual because of the massive frill that it develops. And it occurs right across northern Australia, mostly in the uh, savannah country. The pig-nosed turtle, well, um, pig-nosed turtle has that very unusual face with the tubular nostrils, which makes it look like a, a pig, hence the name. And it occurs in northern Australia, but also in um, southern parts of New Guinea. So it's spread probably from New Guinea to northern Australia sometime in the past. and occurs in just some of the really big, big rivers uh, in northern Australia. And lastly, the long-necked turtle, which is a species of Chelodina. So it's in the, the family Chelidae, which, uh, as we saw last week, 
um, some animals are related and what they call what we call Gondwanan species, where this family Chelidae occurs also in South America. And so it's a link to the time when those the continents were joined in Gondwana and then those two that are separated but those that family of uh, turtles occurs now in South America and in Australia. So Steve, um, well, well people are, are yeah. answering the polls, we might just pick on a pick up on a couple of chat questions. One is the meaning of monsoon, what characterizes a monsoonal climate and without getting too far into the meteorology, it's basically that there's a seasonal wet season that that's just, and the, the rains are associated with uh, low pressure systems that sort of move that are located around the tropics. They move uh, north and south uh, different times of the year and uh, when there is a monsoonal low region or when the monsoonal low moves over your area then that's when there's um, a, a lot of rain a lot of rain forms. So it's very seasonal and it's associated with the winds uh, from a particular direction and and the rains that are associated with those winds. Yeah. And then there's a question about that's mangroves. Right. I don't know if you uh, know, know much about the taxonomy of mangroves, but Steve, but uh, I don't. So. Yeah. No, well, that's, um, that, that is an interesting point, actually. Um, so, yeah, we've had a question there, which is that's actually really interesting because, yeah, the, um, the mangroves, it's, it's strange how it's happened, but they are actually a whole series of different um, plants from different families. So you've got, there are several families like the Rhizophoraceae, for example, that have several representatives, but mostly you have just one or two species, all from different families, that all occur in the mangroves. So it's actually, it's actually really unusual. Um, somehow or other they've evolved. So often they're groups that already had a species that lived along freshwater rivers and so on, or in estuaries. And then they've individually, apparently, evolved the ability to tolerate salt. Uh, so for example, there's a member of the Myrtaceae family, which is the family that has the paper bark and the eucalypts and so on. There's one species that is a mangrove, uh, Osbornia. So actually there are a whole range of families that, that have evolved to become mangroves. Yeah, so it's actually quite unusual how they've all managed somehow by different means uh, to learn how to tolerate salt and to deal with the salt in the water. And there are things too like mangrove ferns, and mangrove uh, mistletoes and so on um, that are kind of associated with mangroves or they're just on the edge of the mangroves. So, yeah, no, that's actually a, that's actually a really good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so it looks we, like uh, some, some people results. need to be, or haven't quite caught up with all the videos yet. There's quite a, quite a few people picked the pig nose turtle instead of yeah. the long neck turtle, which is the, the correct answer. So, well, I guess maybe there was a little bit of confusion possibly because the pig-nosed turtle lays its nest on the sandbank above the water yep. and then when the water comes and floods the nest, that's when the eggs hatch, when okay. they're ready. So it's actually the flooding of the nest or a heavy rain wetting the nest that causes it to hatch. But usually the pig-nosed turtle nest is actually above the water level and so it's not actually underwater. But so. The correct answer, as Keith mentioned, was, was the long neck turtle. And yeah. um, so, yeah. Keith, did you want to just uh, tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, there's a couple of slides here. This one of just a, of an individual long neck, and you can see where it gets its name. And um, the, the next picture, I think, uh, slide, Steve, if you want to move it, uh, which is, a, 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 is an artist's depiction of, of, uh, of long necks nesting underwater. And uh, I don't know if anybody has actually managed to get a picture of this, a real picture of this, but so there's a nice drawing of it. Uh, Rod Kent talked about this in, in one of the videos, but he um, sort of uh, really did a really good job of describing it, but I just might go over one bit that he went over pretty quickly that uh, I think is important for people to understand is that sort of the evolutionary significance of this. Um, first of all, it's, as you mentioned, Steve, it's very unusual, in fact, uh, this is the only species that it's been definitely documented in of reptiles. Uh, it may, some other people in South America are, are suspect that it may be occurring in, in some other Keeley turtles, but uh, uh, the, the, the reason that this is a successful strategy is that uh, in the video we talk about the fact that if the eggs start developing and then they're inundated or then they go underwater, 
the embryo dies. So it's, it, it's important that the egg is laid underwater so that it, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, really start developing. It's more or less in a, in a, a state of stasis or a, a, a suspended animation, if you will, because, due to the lack of oxygen to the egg. And, um, and so if the, if the turtles uh, laid their eggs in the middle of the, of the wet season and then they were inundated, all their eggs would die. So they have, have two choices. One is to wait till the, the end of the uh, wet season. And if they did that, they could probably only get one clutch in. They wouldn't have, really have, because the wet season is also when all the resources are available for them to feed and, and make new eggs. So if they waited really late, they could get one clutch in. By doing it this way, the other option is to, to lay their eggs underwater, just sort of like putting them in the fridge, it's not, not, not really cold, but putting them in a suspended state under the water, go and eat some more uh, food, make a new clutch, and do the, thing, do the same thing over again. So they multiple clutch, three or four clutches uh, in a year instead of just one. And uh, then in the, as the water recedes, then there's oxygen uh, available to the eggs and they start developing and, uh, and so then they have four clutches of three or four clutches of, of eggs uh, rather than just one. So that's the big advantage. Right, so from an evolutionary perspective, uh, that's really, that's sort of going to increase their chances of, of uh, reproduction and therefore that tendency tends to be selected, selected for is that right, Keith? Yeah, yeah. So that uh, the turtles that were able to do that uh, passed on more offspring than the turtles that just waited till the end of the, or either either the turtles that had all their eggs drowned or uh, waited and just till the end of the season and just had a, a single clutch. So that way, the they've right. been passed on uh, once once they evolved the trick, and that the trick is part of the uh, is is sort of a physiological barrier inside the egg. One of the uh, membranes, the eggshell membranes of the uh, of the egg, that prevents the water from passing through, which it does in most in most cases in reptile eggs. Right. So that's that's quite a uh, quite a successful strategy that they they have evolved uh, over time, sort of in this in this environment. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the, the turtle example. We've got a, another question here now. So again. We've spoken a little bit about the environment and I have, think we haven't touched on this um, briefly and I think it's a bit of a mention about this in the video. Shouldn't be too hard a question really in terms of, um, we, do, we do have quite a few fires in the top end and this is true about Northern Australia generally in the Kimberley region and also in Northern parts of Queensland in the Savannah country. Um, fires really are quite common. Uh, they do get lit. Um, by different sources. A lot of them really these days are lit by people, um, you know, for various reasons and sometimes not for necessarily any reason, but um, sometimes just accidentally. Uh, and so I guess if we think about when the fires might happen, so the dry season, which is now, uh, the wet season, which will be starting around about sort of December and going right through till March or even sometimes into April or a little bit later. So. December to March is the main part of the wet season, or this build-up season, which, uh, so as we get towards the end of the dry season and come September, we'll get less dry season weather, and really October, November, this period, uh, a transition season, if you like, between the dry and the wet, when uh, the humidity increases, uh, it gets hotter during the day, uh, you get some cloud, but then you don't tend to get very much rain, so you might get a little light rain, uh, you get lightning and so on, but there's not. Um, if we, we're sort of the, the period when you're, you're waiting for the rain, waiting for the wet season to come. So, um, in terms of most fires, then, uh, and I guess we talk about most of the actual fires lit, and in terms of the area burnt as well, because uh, fires uh, at certain times will burn uh, really well. Uh, so, for example, when it's windy, if you have any type of wind, and a fire will really go. Um, and the other thing I think about fire is that uh, when it's humid, um, you may have noticed it's actually quite can be quite hard to light a fire, uh, and fires don't go so well when when it's very humid. So um, although although they can be lit, but they they'll tend to be, they have a greater tendency to go out 
uh, if you like. So we've had a few people um, make some suggestions. Uh, do we want to publish the, the results of that? Um, so there we go. So as far so we've got um, yeah well that's that's looking pretty good and I um, that's probably a, a good a good result. Most people have suggested the dry season and just a couple of people suggested the build up and that's probably about right in the sense of so some person asked uh, somebody was asking before about the little red spots on the map. Now on that last one we could only see a couple of little red spots. This is a similar image of Northern Australia, uh, but in the middle of the dry season, so in June, and all those little red spots uh, are little where there are actually active fires. So at that period, you can see there's a lot of fires and you can just maybe see the little streaks of smoke. So the winds, um, the winds blowing from the southeast and blowing, so that's perfect fire where the drier winds coming up and out of the desert and uh, causing the fires to really to really take hold because it's low, very, as I mentioned, uh, very low humidity. Um, so at this time in the dry season, uh, you can see uh, lots of fires. But, but Keith, um, someone also mentioned the build-up as being a time when you, when you so you yeah, can they, actually have fires in the build-up as well. Yeah, there certainly are uh, those late dry season or build-up season uh, fires. and. And around that time of year, we start getting uh, thunderstorms. And often, the reason it's called the build-up season is because the humidity builds up. And often, it, it looks like it's going to rain and cool things off, but, but the rain doesn't come. Um, but it, often, there's off a lot of lightning associated with those storms, whether it rains or not. And uh, some of those, some of those uh, lightning uh, storms produce fires. And Traditionally, those fires at that particular time in the late dry season are some of the hottest fires the, and sometimes the biggest fires because uh, everything's really dry. And um, often the, the, the late dry season fires uh, off, get up into the canopy of the, of the tree rather than just being a grass fire that, that uh, goes along the ground and maybe scorches the trunks of trees. These late dry season fires often get up into the canopy and, and in that case, they uh, kill a lot of trees, and so those are considered to be um, uh, the more destructive fires. And that's that's one of the reasons that people light light fires earlier in the year, so that the fires are cooler and um, uh, less destructive. Yeah, that's right. And so that that build-up time um, can be quite spectacular. As you mentioned, Keith, with the, with the lightning storms, and a lot of people like that time of year. Although it's a bit humid and uncomfortable, the uh, the lightning can be can be really amazing. Um, so so there's those natural forms, I guess, of, of, of fires being lit, and then there's people. But then people have been burning this landscape for thousands of years. So it's just that um, maybe they're a little bit different in terms of the way that we do it uh, nowadays. This is uh, just this image now as an example to just show you what it sort of looks like. So a fire's just been through um, this part of the the bush. And you can see still a little bit of uh, a log burning. Mostly it's gone out. And if in the dry season, um, most of the fires, if there's not a big wind behind them, they're actually not... Um, we think of wildfires. So, for example, in southern Australia, wildfires can be very destructive. They go up into the canopy of the forest. They burn through. They burn down houses. They're very destructive things. In northern Australia, it's really generally speaking, a different type of fire, except for maybe like what Keith was speaking about, some of those late dry season fires. But generally speaking, because there's a, a relatively short grass layer that's brown, it, it, it burns through that grass layer, but it, it just sort of creeps through. Um, you can stand there and watch it and be just near it and watch it. And it, it creeps through just, you know, um, you know, a metre every few seconds sort of thing. So you can easily walk faster than it usually or, you know, so it's not uh, it's not a big scary fire, and it doesn't usually get right up into the canopy. So um, it yeah, can be, you know, it's not a. Steve, there's a um, question here about how many of those fires on the map were uh, would have been planned burnoffs. Now, of course, that's a we don't know for sure, but um, I would I would guess that most of, and there's a few accidental fires 
there would be in June there wouldn't have been any lightning strike fires fires I would say There'd be a few accidental fires and I'd say most of them as a guess would be at least planned by somebody uh, that's not to say that it was a very well orchestrated plan that or, or even a good plan but somebody planned them and some they were, they were deliberate and uh, I would say at that time of year. that's right and of course yeah of course the thing with fire is that uh, it's not very easy to control by the nature of what it is and so we have a lot of things that we call controlled burns and some of those things do go where you want them to go and then sometimes they don't so there's, there's really an art to doing things like back burning, clearing fire breaks and so on, and, and doing things and getting the weather conditions right uh, when you do your burn. So uh, sometimes it works, uh, but it doesn't always work necessarily exactly as the way as you would hope it to. But yeah, so it's actually quite tricky to get a burn to do what you want it to do. Um, so again, and so because there are a lot of these fires, uh, a lot of the animals um, actually take advantage of them. So this is an example of a, of a black kite. So some of the birds of prey, so black kites and whistling kites, will come in and where there's fire and there's smoke, they'll actually come into those areas and they will cruise around there looking for uh, animals and so on that are flushed out of those places by the, by the, by the fire. So, and other things as well, like brown falcons, uh, grey falcon, uh, sorry, not grey falcon, grey goshawk, um, different types of birds of prey will actually come into the fires and be attracted to them and look for things as, as animals run off and insects fly away and, and things like that. So um, there's actually, and then after the fire, other animals will come and feed in those areas because say for example, seed eating birds, granivores, will be able to pick seeds off the ground because it's, it's basically bare ground. Yeah. So yeah. there's a few animals that actually can make use of it. Yeah, even, even the frill neck lizards will tend to move into a, a recently burnt area and looking for scorched grasshoppers and whatever that, that they can find, uh, injured insects. Yeah. Yeah, so, and most animals like kangaroos and things will just hop away and, and because, as I mentioned, the fires move fairly slowly um, and birds and so on, most of those sorts of things can get away. If there's animals stuck up in the, in the trees, sometimes they do, they may not make it. Um, so, you know, and the animals are, have evolved with this fire being a regular event, so so in terms of, so I mentioned a little bit about how there's different sorts of ways of, or different types of burning practices. Um, this is just to give you some idea of um, a traditional burning regime. This is based on a study in Arnhem Land um, a few years ago, so published in 1991. And so on the top here, you can see these seasonal names. So we mentioned in the seasonal calendars that uh, a lot of uh, groups uh, people up here have six, recognised six seasons or so, uh, rather than just, you know, four or wet and dry season or whatever. They, they break it down into a whole series of seasons. And so we're currently sort of somewhere between this, so dry season is this period generally. We're sort of at this, getting towards the end of this cold weather time. We've had a bit of, a few cool nights. Um, it's got down to 15 degrees and that sort of thing, so quite cold. And... Uh, we're coming into this hot weather time, so it's starting to warm up. Uh, the day, the, the afternoon is starting to get warmer. The nights will start to get warmer soon. So we're sort of in this period here at the moment. Um, so what they, people tended to do in this traditional uh, burning regime, so this is people walking around on country, lighting fires intentionally in certain places to sort of manage the fire in the landscape. And so in, certain, so in different habitats, so for example in the floodplain habitat, they would do a couple of little fires actually really early on, sort of almost pre-dry season. And they wouldn't spread, they would just go a couple of metres and then go out. So it's quite wet and they couldn't get much of a fire going. And then bits of that habitat would get burnt uh, during the year. The woodland, so this is more your savanna country, they would start in that early part of the dry season and again, burn patches, so burn a patch here, burn another patch there. But again, they would be, uh, might be several hectares, but then the fires would go out at night time. And for example, we tend to have um, some nights in the top end we will get dew. And when you get dew deposited, it gets very wet and the fires tend to go out. So there's those, those sorts of things going on. Uh, in the open forest, which is, is a different sort of form of savannah, 
again, they start a little bit later. And so what this, and, and actually I suppose I should point out down the bottom here, so we've spoken about monsoon forests, those places they didn't burn at all. In fact, in some situations they would burn little burns around the monsoon forest so that those places wouldn't get burned. They'd burn a fire break around those sorts of places because they're important areas, there's lots of fruiting trees, uh, they're shady places, they're nice places to sit in the middle of the day, so they don't want those areas to burn. So there's specific places that, that you don't burn. But I guess importantly out of this, there's a lot of burning in this savanna country, but what that means is, and, and Keith spoke earlier about these big fires in the late dry season that come through, uh, burn large areas, and you know, especially if they get the wind behind them. But the point being here is that if you burn lots of little patches prior to that time, when those big fires do come through, they'll be stopped by these patches of uh, ground that have already been burned. And so with this sort of a burning regime, that's, that was one of the objectives of it. And usually that, that was what happened, was that when those big fires came through, there was already a, a fire break in terms of areas that you've already burned. And so that would, that would stop the fires in their tracks. So oh, someone's mentioned here about things being cold. Yes, well, <laughs> I do always make that joke about um, 15 degrees being a cold night in Darwin because I know it does get a little bit chilly but as you go south in the top end it can get quite cold and Alice Springs, uh, if anyone's ever been there in the middle of winter they know that gets that gets very cold, minus one and it can get can get quite chilly so anyway, it, it's cool, uh, it's relatively cool. <laughs> yeah and because the humidity so, because the humidity is so low you, uh, you also really feel the, the cold and and uh, you cool off really, uh, you know, any uh, sort of evaporation, yeah. if you try to go swimming or anything, then it's, it, you get very chilled with the dry air. Yeah, no, it feels very cold. If, it, if, you're, if you're used to living in Darwin, uh, it, it does feel very cold. And, you know, the, the water's cold, it's too cold to go swimming, <laughs> all those sorts of things. So that's just a little bit about fire. Now, I guess we've spoken a little bit about these... Um, seasonal calendars already and I think I've, I've touched a little bit on that um, and we've given several examples uh, in the MOOC of these different types of seasonal calendars so there's uh, different seasonal calendars from different places in the top end but I think there's also some there from the Kimberley region so um, people recognize slightly different seasons they have different names obviously because most of these uh, groups of people had different languages. Uh, some of the languages are related, some not so related. So, um, and then they use different uh, types of indicators um, to to recognise, you know, what's what's going on. So, and I think a lot of it was tied to things like, you know, when's a good time to go and hunt. So, when are the turtles going to be nice and fat? Um, when's a good time to catch goannas? Uh, you know, when, when's a good time to, to look for uh, certain times of bush food, you know, certain uh, plants might be uh, fruiting at, at certain times of year. When's a good time to go and look uh, for food, you know? So it, a lot of it was really directed towards, um, you know, surviving and, and having um, having food all the year round. So people had a pretty intimate knowledge of, of when, when things would happen and so on. Uh, so have we got any... We've got a, a couple of responses here to this... Um, this question. Um, what do what do people think about that? Uh, so I think we've got. Let's see. Oh, we've got another D. So yeah, I think that's sounding pretty good. So weather. Well, yeah, weather is very important. And I guess in a sense, you know, you sort of feel the weather changing, and, and you, you'll notice when the the set up east winds of the dry season come through, and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, really, people noticed. Um, so certain plants might be in flower. If that plant's in flower, that means it's now a good time to go and look for stingray. You know, so those sorts of things. So they would they would suggest um, that's you know it's a particularly good time. So and these things are, are, are related to each other uh, in that in that type of scheme. This so so really. Um, Lots of different things. This is just an example of the seasonal calendar. So this is the Larrakia. And so the Larrakia people are the ones uh, who are uh, the area around Darwin. So Darwin Harbour 
and basically all that area surrounding. So um, coastal people effectively, so they have resources not only from the coastal areas, so things like stingray and turtle and, and fish uh, and other, you know, shellfish and so on, and also mangrove uh, animals, but also um, things like uh, magpie goose, which is a very important source of food, but also in certain seasons, uh, magpie goose eggs. Um, and there's some examples here, and here are some of the, the names um, for, for different animals and different plants uh, in, in the Larrakia language. So some of these very common plants, the stringy bark and woolly bark are both very common, savannah trees near Darwin. This is the agile wallaby, Melula, uh, and things like long neck turtle, bunny mother. I like that name. It sounds like it's it's messing around in the mud, which is a lot, which is what um, what turtles can do. And this uh, bush apple here, which is uh, it's actually a species of Syzygium, and it grows quite a large fruit, um, and it's sort of it's fleshy uh, and it's it's quite it's actually quite refreshing. So uh, lots of names for all the different uh, parts of the environment, and particularly animals and plants that have uses in terms of food value or medicinal value or, or any of those things. Um, and I just thought I'd mention briefly, um, because the way things are managed uh, in Northern Australia, increasingly um, traditional owners, Aboriginal people, are uh, managing their land or caring for country, as it's, as it's often called. Um, and one way in which they're doing that is by declaring these Indigenous protected areas and so you can see several examples here. These numbers just relate to these areas. So there's the Wadakan IPA, the Jelk IPA. There's some over here on the islands. Um, and what they are, they're just areas, it's, it's an arrangement with the Commonwealth Government um, and it means that people, um, there's a little bit of funding there for people to care for the country. So whether they're dealing with weeds, whether they're controlling fire and and of course fire uh, abatement and so on is important in terms of controlling greenhouse so they might be reducing the amount of greenhouse emissions uh, dealing with feral animals things like cats and buffalo and those sorts of things so there's a whole range of activities that uh, these uh, that people are involved in you can see here in grey is the area this is all Arnhem land so this is Aboriginal land and there's also a few other these pinkish areas so this is Kakadu these are national parks uh, there's Litchfield here so they also represent uh, their, their conservation lands. So there's a few of these IPAs and you can find out about that on the environment uh, environment website, environment.gov.au. All right, so we've already talked a bit about weather. Um, so we've, we've spoken a bit about this, this uh, monsoon climate and Keith was mentioning how the, the monsoon climate goes really back and forth. So. Um, because we're experiencing dry season conditions here. So this is a, a chart uh, from the Bureau of Meteorology and this was just from the other day and this is typical of what's going on at the moment. So you have a big high pressure system and so we talk about the high in the bite. There's a big high in the bite today and what that means is because these winds, these, this cell is rotating this way, we get these southeast winds coming up from the desert. So as I mentioned before, these winds coming up and that brings that very dry air and that's you know why we get the fires that, that take off and all those sorts of things so um, at the moment that's pretty typical for what we are experiencing uh, in northern australia so in terms of other places in the world um really uh, i guess it's probably really reasonably obvious in terms of um dry season conditions uh, if we think about Sydney, well, that's down in southern Australia. They're actually getting their winter weather, so they tend to get cold fronts moving through. Uh, now, India, because they get the monsoon in the northern hemisphere and it travels the northern hemisphere and then it travels back down across the equator and then down to the southern hemisphere. Yeah. So really, in India at the moment, it's the dry season here, so it's their wet season at the moment. So they're getting the opposite end of it. And then it'll turn around and come back, and the wet season will come back uh, oh, down a, to northern Australia. There's a comment, Steve. A chat so, comment, so, uh, confirming yeah. what you just said that um, that in oh, India right go. now it's raining and showering, and weather is humid. So we got it first. Oh, that's great. So we've got we've got someone from India saying this is exactly that. So they're having their wet soon, so their monsoon, and really the term monsoon comes from you know up there 
it's uh, it's actually based on an Arabic uh, word. Um, so that, and then that same system comes down all the way to northern Australia. So uh, it's interesting. So you know what's happening there might then affect what's going to happen here. Uh, you know a few months down the track. So that's really interesting. Uh, so the, the correct thing there really is then um, in Timor in terms of, so Timor is just up here to the north of Australia and they actually have a, a very prolonged uh, and obvious dry season. So in Timor at the moment it's actually quite dry as well, particularly because it's that very southeastern end of the, of, of the Indonesian archipelago or you know, the Malay uh, archipelago if we like. All right, so, and of course, because it is the dry season, so we spoke about the various environments. This is another one, the paperbark swamp. So, as you can see, this paperbark swamp in the dry season uh, is very, very dry. Um, but in the wet season, that whole area would be completely inundated with water. So, it's, it's, um, it's uh, about a half, half a metre or a metre depth. For that sort of depth, not very deep, but totally filled with water. And then by the late dry season, uh, all the water is completely gone, it evaporates, it, it goes into the soil, um, there's no water at all there. So you can see where the water level might actually be uh, in the wet season. So that's a paper bark or Melaleuca swamp. Um, and of course as well in the dry season uh, we have places like this where this is a, a wetland, this is Nucky's Lagoon near Darwin. And because there's not much water around, all the water birds, so here's a lot of magpie geese, there's egrets, there's ducks and so on there, they congregate in these areas. Wherever there's a little bit of water, uh, the water birds will congregate and these are uh, dry season refugia, uh, we call them. Um, and another thing that's going on at the moment, I'll just mention this briefly, is that there's a lot of, um, there's actually quite a few uh, plants that are in flower, and this is important for birds, uh, for the nectar, for insects, and also to some extent for things like bats. So this is a grevillea. So there's various grevilleas flowering at the moment. This one's uh, called caustic bush. This one, grevillea trudifolia, is very important at the top end for um, for birds and for insects. Lots of nectar. It produces, and actually you can dip it in water and, and use it as a kind of honey, you know, for your cup of tea or whatever. It's so lots of nectar. And the other thing is there's certain things flowering like this currajong, and I mentioned about some of the species being deciduous, so they drop their leaves in the dry season, and this currajong drops its leaves, is completely leafless, as you can see there are the branches, and then produces flower, flowers on the, on the stems without any leaves at all. Um, some of the paper barks are in flower, there's a massive blossom on this one, it's an example, and this is important, so for example at night time, uh, fruit bats will come in here and feed on the blossom and, and suck on the nectar and then during the day the honey eaters and the other birds and so on, lorikeets and so on will use this as well. Uh, so I might just skip to this. So we've had a little bit of um, a couple of things on the forums. Um, I mentioned a couple of things about wetlands and uh, also, the, uh, an interesting thing this time of year is the flatback turtles, which actually breed in the top end in the dry season. Uh, and this is actually a very important area for, for that sort of, uh, that's a marine turtle, so on the coastal areas. Someone mentioned about the um, Arctic tern uh, migration, which uh, is really interesting because they fly all the way from the Arctic all the way down to the south and down to the Antarctic to the Southern Ocean. Uh, so it's an absolutely massive uh, migration, so seasonal migration in response to um, in response to the changing of the seasons. Uh, and um, for what I've been able to find, that's the the longest migration of any known species. They've travelled thousands of kilometres uh, every year. Um, so not quite as impressive, but also very impressive. Uh, these are examples of some waders or shorebirds, and. At this time of year uh, in, in Australia, there is a few waders around, but they will be coming down from the Northern Hemisphere in the next couple of months. So in about mid-September, so not too far away, is when the waders start to arrive uh, in Northern Australia. So they're kind of on their way now, making their way down, and they also come from right up in Russia and, and, and way up in the tundra and so on, and come fly all the way down to Australia. Places like Darwin and Northern Australia, and then also spread out around 
around Australia. So they are uh, they're on their way on their way soon. So, uh, but please put some comments on the forums about what's happening in terms of seasonal changes and animals and plants in, in wherever you are in, in different parts of the world uh, or different parts of Australia. We'd be interested to hear um, hear what's going on. And we'll just, uh, we're getting sort of towards the end here, so we'll just finish with a little bit about frogs. Um, frogs is a passion of mine, and I think Keith is, uh, is, is, is uh, he's a real expert on, on this whole area as well. And we, I've just got some examples here of some uh, frogs calling in the wet season. Uh, so we've got, a, we've got a green tree frog in the middle, we've got a uh, burrowing frog, <coughs> Cyclorana, we've got um, a Roth frog here. Uh, so we've got a few different examples. And so in the wet season we see lots of frogs, but at this time of year it's been a real quandary um, for us in terms of finding, you know, where do the frogs go in the dry season. And for a few species, so this is an example of Latoria mariana or the rock pole frog. Um, and you can see here they are, a couple of frogs. There's actually quite a few frogs in this photo. There's another one there, there's another one here. And they're sitting around a little water body, um, some rock, rock pools. Uh, this is in Litchfield National Park. And they hang out around, um, around water. But for a lot of species, um, we're not that clear on what they actually do. So here's a green, uh, green tree frog sitting in a tree hollow. Um, and they, um, so they really do, they're very good at, um, they really do climb trees. Around Darwin, they live in people's houses, but out in the out in the actual bush, uh, they do find little tree hollows like this, and they'll slide down into the tree hollow and and hide out in the tree hollow during the day. Yeah. <clears throat> you said uh, that there's one one of the videos talking about how uh, green tree fro frogs exploit this kind of habitat and actually gain water by shuttling in and out of it. Um, but uh, yeah, quite a few different tree frogs probably use these tree hollows which make them really important for a whole lot of different kind of animals uh, tree as well as uh, frogs with snakes and some lizards and uh, some small mammals also depend on uh, hollow trees and a lot of the hollows are the result of uh, termite uh, attacks on the, on the trees so um, a, a big interconnection there different kinds of animals one other kind of habitat that I don't think we have a picture of, that some frogs go down into the cracks uh, in the mud. Uh, so particularly on the flood plains, black soil makes, uh, make, when it dries out, there are big cracks and they go, uh, can go very deep. And down at the bottom of those cracks, there's a little bit of moisture. And uh, so the frogs sort of migrate all the way down or move down and probably follow the cracks, go farther down as, uh, as the um, moisture recedes underground. So there are a, a variety of different habitats used by frogs. Yeah. Yeah, and they all have, they seem to have these different strategies um, of, of hiding out um, and getting away because as you can imagine, being a frog, it's the dry season. As we mentioned, it's, it's uh, not very, the, the air is not very humid. It doesn't rain for maybe six months uh, for a very long period of time. And so we do know that there's a group of species, and these, these six species all occur uh, around the Darwin region, so within, say, 50 kilometres of Darwin, uh, and they all burrow. Um, for some of them, we've got a, we've got a good idea about um, what, they, what they actually do, um, but for quite a few of them, um, we only really see them in the wet season, and so we know they burrow, we know they've gone somewhere. Um, and so there's a range of different, different species here, uh, that burrow, and I guess one uh, particular area of research that we have been interested in is this. Uh, this is what's sometimes called the giant burrowing frog, or Cyclorana australis. Uh, and what it does is it, it burrows, uh, and it's like the water holding frog that I think people might have heard about in Central Australia. It's in the same group, and forms this cocoon. And so here you can see this is the early cocoon. So this is the a wake frog with its with its wet skin. So when you touch it, it's wet skin. This is the early cocoon, and this is what I call the the glad wrap uh, look. It just sort of wraps around the frog, and when you touch the frog, it's fairly thin, but this is completely dry. Um, 
And then later, so this is a frog that's been underground and it's been underground for several months and it has quite a thick cocoon, it goes quite hard. And as you can see, this cocoon envelops the entire body and see even the little fingers here and there's the hand. So even the little fingers are covered by this, uh, by this cocoon. Uh, and this is another, another image of it there. So you can see the face and there's the little fingers as well. Um, and so this is an, an adaptation allowing these frogs to survive uh, in the dry season. You've got a question here, Steve. Are, are many of the Australian frogs poisonous? Um, and I, I guess the answer to that is uh, there, there are quite a few that have some toxin. You don't want to, a lot of frogs you don't want to handle and then rub your eyes, you'll get a, an irritation, but they're not deadly poisonous. Uh, the cane toads are, are or uh, have uh, poison glands and are, uh, have pretty significant kind of poison, but they're of course not native to Australia. So there are a few Australian frogs that are probably pretty unpalatable, but they're not uh, in the same category as say some of the South American poison dart frogs, uh, for example, that are, are really uh, very seriously poisonous. Yeah, I mean that's right. I think a lot of the frogs do have glands and you can see uh, they have glands in the skin, so for example, uh, this frog, this uh, noted in species, has unusual uh, back patterns and so on. These, um, this Eucarolia here has glands along the legs, and it also has glands here behind the eyeball, and presumably uh, those glands do serve uh, some function. So it might be that they're unpalatable to potential predators, um, so birds or small mammals or things that might eat them. But I think you would say, maybe Keith, that you probably wouldn't want to try eating one. Like they're not um, that poisonous, but then you probably wouldn't want to, yeah, they probably wouldn't be that tasty either. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but they are, they are partially, um, they're partially poisonous, I guess you would say. Yeah, and even, um, even the green so, frog uh, has can irritate a lot, uh, can be irritating, so they have secretions that help uh, reduce their water loss. Most of the tree frogs have that sort of secretions, and those secretions probably serve several different functions, primarily to prevent water loss or to slow down water loss, but they also um, um, are, are, are irritating. The, the, the secretions are irritating. If you get it in your eyes, it can really, uh, really burn. Some people are uh, are sort of allergic to it, they have a, a, an almost immediate reaction and um, really don't want to be around green tree frogs too much, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, not a serious poison, but it's probably enough to, to help deter some predators. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, well, um, so I think that's um, really, we've got this, uh, we've just mentioned about the cocoons here, I think that's probably uh, pretty much it, I guess. The only thing we might mention is that um, one one interesting uh, side of that was that um, these these cocoons that we see here, uh, we'd always thought that the the frogs went underground and formed a cocoon basically as soon as they went underground. But um, with some radio tracking studies and some other work that we did looking at soil moisture and so on, we discovered that what they actually do is they go underground. They sit there and if the soil is still moist and they can still absorb water from the soil because frogs can actually extract moisture from wet soil, then they won't form the cocoon. But once the soil dries out, then they will actually start forming the cocoon. So they sort of leave it for a little while uh, while they're sitting underground, which was which was really quite unusual. It wasn't, wasn't really what we uh, expected. So I think that's probably it um, for today. And this is the last... Uh, webinar for the MOOC, so I guess I really just want to thank um, Keith and, and Janet for, for doing the webinars and all their involvement. Um, and there's also a whole range of other people, um, Dan and Bob Pello and, uh, and Karen's been helping us out and Alison, um, and all these people helping us out with the webinars, helping us out to set, set up the MOOC and do all those sorts of things. So without those people, um, none of this would, would really be possible. So that's, that's great to have all, all their involvement as well. Um, and thank you to all the people who've, who've uh, participated. 
Um, yeah. Do you have any, have any comments, Keith? Yeah, well, just uh, thank you, Steve. And, and also to say that uh, it's possible to join the MOOC. Uh, this is the last webinar, but it's possible to join if you want to uh, let somebody else know about it till the end of August. And then it, it'll be accessible to anybody who's joined by, uh, by, by the end of August. They'll be able to see it at least until the uh, end of October. Um, we'll, at some stage, we'll stop monitoring the, uh, the, the chat board and so forth and probably close that off, but the materials and the videos and so forth will be, a, will be available at least till the uh, end of October. And also, uh, MOOC has also been migrated to iTunes U, so um, it, that's a bit less interactive in that there's no chat uh, board or anything like that, but uh, the videos and most of the content, the information, is is a, available to you on iTunes U. So uh, thanks yeah. very much for everybody to everybody for joining us. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Goodbye.